Professor P.A., thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Why don't we start with, uh, you know, your career so far? Where did you start off? Uh, where have you been? And uh, what are you doing now? Yeah, actually, I had a rather um, unorthodox entry into the academy. Uh, you know, I started off pretty long. I was a political science student at Lamar University uh, that ultimately wanted to go to law school. Um, and about the time that I graduated from undergraduate uh, studies, Around 2006 to 2008, a couple of things happened. Uh, the first thing happened is that the uh, post-law school market collapsed. So there were some of our friends that were a few years ahead of me that were struggling to find jobs because the market was oversaturated and things like that. Uh, the second thing that happened was the iPhone came out. So uh, there was a lot of money in selling iPhones. So I went into that and did that for about five years, right? until uh, a gentleman that was actually in some of my political science classes uh, approached me at my job at at, at at AT&T and said, uh, what are you doing teaching? You know, you, you know, it's like, do you want to come teach? And I was like, teach, hmm, okay, sure. So I taught high school for the next seven years um, out in Texas. Um, and, but I always knew that I wanted to get back into school. That wasn't the end game. So I, I did my master's at Sam Houston State, and that's where I met a couple of people, Stacey, Dr. Stacy Olbig and Dr. Uh, Heather Evans, who said, you're going to go get your PhD. You're good at this. You like doing the research and stuff like that. So along the way, I connected with uh, another professor who was at the University of Oklahoma. Her name was Dr. Uh, Elisa Hickman Fryer. Um, and she got me up to a visit, and I met a bunch of folks at the University of Oklahoma that had this weird approach to understanding institutions and policy making and decision making, um, and it was really appealing. And then once I got there, um, I realized that it was they had a cadre of youngish, uh, really really brilliant minds there, right, uh, who were deeply embedded in theories of the policy process. So folks like Hank Jenkins Smith, who, uh, if you're familiar with advocacy coalition framework, he's very central in that line of thinking. Uh, Sam Workman, who studies, uh, you know, political institutions, information processing, he's a, he's in the lineage of folks like Peter May, Brian Jones, Frank Baumgartner, um, Alisa Hickman Fryer, who's also in conversation or as a student of, uh, of uh, Ken Meyer. So there, there are these really deep lineages in understanding policy processes that really shaped how I think about policy making and political institutions. Um, and of course, my interest in how and where marginalized communities fit in within that process led me to explore these questions further um, in my dissertation and future works. Uh, I was hired at Georgia State in the fall of 2020. I moved to Atlanta in the, the midst of the pandemic. Uh, not that Georgia shut down or anything like that, but it was still kind of, you know, like eye opening to, to make a transition halfway across the country um, in the middle of the pandemic. And I've been there for the last three years. Um, and next year, I'll be fortunate enough to transition to the University of Maryland College Park, uh, where I'll be joining this, the Department of African American Studies there at UMD. So that's that's basically where I am right now, and it's 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 really exciting uh, to be able to share some of this work that I've, I've come across over the past few years with you. Fantastic. I mean, let's let's talk about you know the areas of your research. So I know that uh, you've got a few different things that you've been working on, and one of the ideas you know, that you explore is this idea of, uh, you know, institutional barriers uh, to, I guess, representation or even once when, when someone enters Congress, you know, if uh, how they can get action or the, get movement inside the institution and what what, what avenues they have to, to pursue those interests. So can you talk through kind of what questions you have in this area, you know, about institutional barriers, representation, what questions have you had and what have you found in your research? Yeah, for sure. So the, the big question that motivates my research or the big areas that I study, first of all, uh, I study racial and ethnic politics within political institutions, right? Uh, I, I study at its core representation uh, of black and brown interests. Um, I do that through a lens of uh, policy process literature. So I look specifically at things like agenda setting, information processing, coalition building, policy implementation, 
um, those aspects of the policy making process through both the qualitative and quantitative lens. Now, in terms of the, the big motivating questions, uh, my research looks specifically at how black and brown folk use collective action to shape uh, policy activities both within, from within and from outside of political making legislating institutions. Um, and, and that appears at its surface to be two different uh, like lines of research. So on one hand, within institutions, I view collective actions, of course, through the creation and running of caucuses within the institution. On the, from, from outside, I look at largely protests, right? But there's this unique intersection that I, I come about uh, where protests are informing uh, collective action within the institution and collective action within the institution is informing protests uh, and, and organizations on the outside. So there's this, there's this bond between them that I look at. And in, in studying that, I have to ask a few questions. The, and the first and foremost is why? Why do they need collective action within the political institutions? And to understand the need for collective actions, you have to understand how minority and underrepresented groups operate within racialized political institutions, right? And, and the first thing that we have to understand is that political institutions are naturally unresponsive to minority issues, right? If we just look at it at face value, uh, they are slow to act on certain problems that may arise in black and brown communities, but also they are uh, beholden in a lot of ways to a status quo that isn't very friendly to uh, marginalized communities to begin with, right? Um, so there's a need for there to be some type of activities that can kind of jar uh, those within the institution to move away from the status quo. And in a lot of instances, the, the status quo itself is problematic, but also the institution itself is problematic in, in responding to black and brown issues. But the other issue that we have to face uh, or that we have to confront as we're looking at why they need collective action is because as an individual, there are individual there are barriers within the institution that impede their ability to achieve real substantive policy change, right? Uh, some of the works uh, look at how there's interpersonal uh, barriers, like uh, Mary Hawksworth's work that looked at how the experience of a Black woman in, in congressional committees, they're subject to othering and silences and silencing and, and uh, you know, topic extinction and things like that, right? Uh, and how they're forced to endure certain conditions that their counterparts aren't subject to. I have work uh, in the Journal of Race and Ethnic Politics where it looks at when Black members sponsor bills, they're winnowed at disproportionate rates uh, uh, compared to even white white Democrats and members of the, of, uh, the GOP, right? So as an individual, it's really hard to break through a lot of these walls that they're trying to, uh, to, to overcome. Some of them ha that happen naturally, like winnowing. Winnowing is a natural process. Of when a bill goes in the hopper, not all of them will come out of the hopper, right? Uh, not all of them will make it onto a committee agenda, and only a small fraction of them will make it to the House floor for a vote, and that number is decreasing significantly over time. Well, what my studies and other studies have found is that these processes that appear to be natural functions of institutions uh, designed to solve problems, uh, are, while they are natural, they're not colorblind, right? And that there are inherent barriers and that exist for marginalized folks who are trying to to achieve similar things to their counterparts. The other issue that they have is access. Um, for a long time, minority members were uh, relegated to less important committees and uh, to where they would have access over uh, legislative processes or access to leadership positions. And that in and of itself created a barrier because why they're not able to influence uh, the agenda as a rank and file member, and they're also not privy to a lot of the influence that um, leadership has over, legisl over legislative processes and the legislative agenda. Um, another issue that they have is problems with like gathering information, right? Um, they, it, there are specific issues that plague these communities, 
and members from these marginalized communities need ways to access this information, to reach out to experts, to, uh, you know, to accumulate, to disseminate, and to deploy this information to shape policy agendas and outcomes. And one, if you're not provided with access onto relevant committees, or if you're not have, if you don't have leadership uh, or, or black and brown folk in leadership, your ability to access this information through traditional congressional means, i.e., congressional committees, is diminished as well. So there, there are these numbers, there, there are these significant barriers, or these inherent barriers that exist that uh, that in a way exist for all members, but disproportionately impact. Uh, minority members, uh, and because of this, they need collective action to circumvent that. So rather than relying on an institution that, that is inherently uh, in inherently restrictive, they create their own institution to accomplish a lot of these uh, these 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 needs or to serve some of these desires. It's interesting, you know. So the House is a majoritarian, really, institution. So it it. it... I can understand the logic of like any kind of minority group having a difficulty in getting getting its will through through a majoritarian kind of mm -hmm. institution, you know, and that there are institutional barriers to that. Is there something specific to as you as you call black and brown groups that makes that more difficult, or is it kind of is this a universal problem across all minority groups? There are certainly aspects of the institution that would disproportionately impact black and brown folks, right? Um, I think one of the things is that because the Congressional Black Caucus is overwhelmingly Democrat, right? One would expect them to be able to leverage that the, that connection or the tie to the party um, to, to kind of extract things as they go along, right? But, but the problem with that is that the Democratic Party and Democratic leadership actively avoid addressing a lot of the issues that are at the deepest concerns of Black and brown communities, right? For a number of reasons, right? I mean, out of fear of uh, political backlash, uh, out of fear of dividing some of the other factions within the, the party, right? And, and, and instituting an, an, uh, inter-party conflict. So the normal means that members and collectives within the institutions could use to influence these processes. There are additional barriers in, 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 in addition to those that naturally exist. There are like inter-party problems or conflicts, right? There's There are uh, pressures, external pressures from the mass public and other organized uh, interests that operate against uh, marginalized communities seeking out policy change within the institution. So that's definitely something that's unique about their 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 the issues that they promote within the institution and the responsiveness to those issues. But I also think what's unique about the Congressional Black Caucus in particular is the sophistication of that the the organization, the infrastructure of the Congressional Black Caucus is different than you know the Peanut Caucus that you might find, right? It's not. It's it's certainly different. It's it's also um, very deliberately constructed and it's evolved over time. And that's a little bit about what my work looks at is like how these decisions and how the 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 construction of the organization has changed over time and what that means for their their effectiveness and their ability to pursue change in these areas. So I definitely want to dive into the into the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, but before we do that, I, I'm curious your perspective on the Senate compared to the House, because, you know, in some ways people say, you know, the, the Senate's a minor is is a is a super minority institution because one person can block can block everything. Um do you I don't know, have you studied the Senate in comparison to the House and whether all the dynamics play out different because you have, you know, concentrated power in each individual? And does that help or hurt minority interests? Oh, it absolutely harms uh, minority interests, uh, largely uh, because of exactly what you're pointing out, right? It, it only takes one person to stall progress, or it appears that it could only take one person to solve progress. But at a more fundamental level, that mechanism that they use for filibuster is overwhelmingly used to stop racial progress above and beyond any other means of progress or any types of policy change, right? Like if we go through and look at the times and count up the work, the, 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 the times that the filibuster has been employed over, uh, over time, it's disproportionately used for racial racial issues, right? 
and the the requirements for the filibuster have become so lax that it doesn't even need to be a speaking filibuster at this point in time. You can just not have, not make closure and the bill, the bill dies, right? Um, so I think there's a number of ways, for example, you can have progress in the House and it's a non-starter in the Senate um, and it will, it will never make the floor like the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, right? It's clear the it's clear the House two year two terms in a row, and it will never re admit, uh, come up to a vote because it won't pass it. Um, so there's all these different things that that at the Senate level that make it in a way easier to prevent change, and also the fact that my, like black and brown members within the Senate are even more underrepresented in the Senate than they are in the House. So this collective presence within that organization, within that body uh, is lacking in a way that is not lacking um, in, at the House level. Yeah, that, I guess that makes sense, you know, in, in terms of just the, the gross numbers uh, in the Senate. But, you know, I also wonder since, since even the presumably the black members in the Senate can also filibuster, does that give them does that give them any extra powers that they wouldn't have in the house? Right. Cause in the house, they couldn't stop anything as a, as a group of minorities, but you know, the, the, the members in the Senate in theory could, could block things and might be able to get their way. I guess that's just, I'm, I'm curious whether that kind of dynamic has ever played out in the Senate or if it's, it's, it's railroading no matter what. Uh, I think that largely assumes that there are also members within their own party that will support them in their filibuster and not support the opposition view, right? Part of the reason why issues like DC statehood and you know the uh, George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and the the updated Voting Rights Act are dead on arrival in the Senate is largely because it's all Republicans who are blocking it. It's because there are members of the Democratic Party that are also actively opposing and also contributing to the imbalance of power for regressive or like anti-transformative uh, policy proposals. So I think that is that also creates some of the balance, right? Like it's and it's been like that with the blue, blue dog Democrats, your Dixie Crats. There have always been people within the Democratic Party who are not as committed to racial progress. So it the all of these things compound. Uh, the underrepresented minority voices, the inability to disperse those voices across the different Senate committees because they are underrepresented, the lack of influence uh, within leadership within the Senate, and the filibuster, which actively serves to repress any type of progress that may come from the, the House side. All of these things are, are inherent barriers to racial progress, and there's a, a, a dire need for members uh, uh, from those communities to try to, to circumvent them. It's interesting that you you uh, draw such a strong lesson from the from the parties themselves, right? Within the party dynamic is so critical, as opposed to you know the the group itself. Um, you know, since it sounds like the group itself is mainly focused on the Democratic Party, so you have that issue. So maybe that brings us to the Black Caucus, right? And so let's, let's dive into you know, can you talk through what is the Black Caucus? Why does it exist? What have you learned about it? How does it work? Uh, and what is its impact then? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I guess we could start from the beginning, right? The the Congressional Black Caucus um, was or first organized in seventy one uh, with uh, I believe it was thirteen uh, black members of of the House of Representatives. Um, and at the time, there was a dire need to collectivize, right? But they recognized um, through a number of struggles o over time, right? But there was an initial call to arms of uh, let's let's we have a baker's dozen of, of members in the house let's try to coordinate right but it was more so um a call to arms to do something other than what they had been doing this entire time right the, this the the definition of insanity basically in the argument was to like let's stop doing the same thing over and over and expect a different outcome but there were also specific needs that those members needed that they that they uh, observed that they couldn't solve individually right they needed um in their words to be able to reach out to area experts within the community to tie these different communities together to be able to understand 
uh, problems that are plaguing Black Americans, not just in their districts, but they had to fulfill this obligation that they're serving all Black Americans everywhere in, in America, right? And they had to find a way to tap into these different regions that they may not have had uh, prior, without some type of collective organization. They also understood that the demands uh, on their staff members uh, weren't sustainable, that they needed some way to collectivize staff work and resources in order to try to seek out uh, seek out policy change because staff are vitally important to their members. They also realized that they had to come up with a collective agenda. And up to that point, there was no agenda for the advancement of Black America that was put forth in front of Congress, right? There were tons of smaller ideas, but none of them were put together in a package to where the, the, the Black members in Congress could say, these are our ideas of how we can advance the Black condition in America. So there were all of these, 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 like, these ideas that they had to, to like, make themselves more effective. But they couldn't do it without a collective presence. So they, they created the caucus. And the caucus changed over time for a number of reasons, right? A lot of times out of the natural evolution, a lot of times the organization changed um, because they noticed some deficiencies in how they were operating uh, in relation to the demands of the organization. And also sometimes they changed because the institution forced them to change. Right, because during like, for example, the the contract with American people when the Gingrich came in the term, um, he did away with the legislature with the LSOs, right, and that forced them to rethink what the caucus would mean moving forward. Um, all of these transitions over time has led the caucus to what it is today, and what it is today is one of the most powerful uh, caucuses within the institution. It has it has anywhere in between 50 to 58 members at a given time at this point. Um, very, very well influ influenced people within the caucus, uh, highly influential people within the caucus, like Clyburn, like Hakeem Jeffries, like several committee chairs and subcommittee chairs. Um, and you also have a, a, a robust uh, young co cohort of congressional Black members who are also re- uh, they're, they're, they're reimagining what the caucus could be over the next 30 to 50, 200 years. So that's what it is as an entity, right? But it's it's deeper than that. It's a little bit more sophisticated than that, right? Um, they have a built-in infrastructure that facilitates their needs as both as individual members and as a collective organization, right? They have a rather sophisticated task force and working group system. Right, to where they, they break out into their own committee structures and engage in this information processing. This, this, they go out and seek out expert information. They engage with the, the agencies, the bureaucrats. Um, they, they engage in things like uh, hosting floor speeches. They're called uh, CBC special order hour speeches um, to take the information that they've acquired from their outreach efforts and use them on the House floor and in committees and things like that. They have a legislative, uh, they have a legislative uh, conference every year to, again, bring all of these, these minds together that are interested in advancing the Black condition, uh, condition and figure out what's changed, what needs to be adapted, or figure out if they're viewing the world in, in a way that is, is uh, useful and appropriate and, and in a way that can seek out change and things like that. But there are a lot of mechanisms that the caucus has developed over time that most caucuses within the institution lack. And because of that, the, it, 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 I argue it makes them for a more effective individual um, lawmakers, but it also improves their ability to collectivize and shape Congress as an organization. So it's interesting with the way you break down the, you know, the function, I guess, of the of the caucus. So on the one side, you mentioned this concept of information collection, right? Uh, so each individual member, they can only get so much information from their constituents. And so you can imagine an organization that would be more systematic in, in pulling together what the problems of the community are, their specific community. And, and so that's the one side, is like collecting this information. Um, 
so I can imagine, I understand that, that, that idea. And then I understand the idea of them collectively working towards some kind of legislative outcome they're trying to create, they're trying to, to get at. Uh, and then I can also, of course, imagine that they, that, that for any kind of group, um, they're using it as a way for them to get, you know, more of their members or whatever into, into higher committee status. So they're, they're, they're using it for personal advancement as well as uh, collective advancement. Um, so when you think about like what it's done over time, do you think it's been equally successful in all those areas and, or has it been outsized success in certain areas versus others? Like, do they really understand what's going on in the community, but, and they're good at getting legislation done, but they don't get a lot of personal advancement. You know, where do you see like how it's, how it's played out over the years? Yeah, I think um, if we were to break it down into like those three like areas, right. How, how effective it is for personal advancement, how, how effective it is at, at, um, outreach efforts, how effective it is at, at actually addressing collectively the needs of the people. I think it goes in ebbs and flows, right? There are times where, and, and largely by design, because there are certain periods over time, over the last 50 years, the organization is now like 50, 52 years old, um, there have been long stints of, of, of time where the Democrats have been in the minority, right? They're in the minority for almost 20 years. Um, and that also limits their effectiveness, right? Just in general, or their ability to, to extract goods and services for the Black community in general. But what it also allows them to do is to engage in some of those other types of legislative activities, to, 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 to disperse their influence within the committees and shape the different ideas that people have and the different conceptions of problems that they have, right, within the institution, right, to use discourse to, to, to change ideas and change minds. It also gives them time to build and restructure their agenda, right, so they, where they might have spent more time on influ on extracting some some policy gains under democratic majorities um they focus more to their agenda setting during uh, when they're in the minority right so there 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 are ebbs and flows but the what i what i also argue is that in absence of the organization all three of those would suffer right you wouldn't have the mechanisms that you have to disseminate uh to to, to gather information to process that information, to, to deploy that information within the institution. You wouldn't have um, a, a means to collectivize and, and have that collective agenda to, to, to pursue. Um, and you, you, you probably wouldn't have, you might have individual members here or there um, that might ascend the leadership ranks or, or like chair committees and things like that. Like that's, that's certainly a possibility. But what you what you lack is this collective leverage that a lot of these members have to argue that you know Maxine Waters needs to sit atop the committee, or to argue that Jim Clyburn needs to be the whip, or to argue that Hakeem Jeffries would be should be the uh, the speaker in waiting. Like those are the types of leverage that you're able to get as a collective that you may not be able to achieve as individuals. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. What about in terms of the membership of of the um, of the caucus? Is it is it all the black and brown members of Congress, as you would say, or are there is it only the Democrats, or how does it work? You know, yeah. Just take, can you take me through like what are the requirements to join the caucus, or who does or doesn't join the caucus, and are there rival caucuses? Um, so I think the Congressional Black Caucus is distinct from uh, other minority caucuses in that way. The <laughs> membership is, you, you, you can opt into that membership, right? Like as, as a black member of Congress, uh, it's open to Democrats and Republicans and not all Republicans have taken opportunities, right? To, to join the, the organization like JC Watt refused to join the Congressional Black Caucus uh, back in the day. Uh, Mia Love did, right? And Mia Love actually said that uh, she wanted to join the caucus to destroy it from the inside. Um, and uh, of course, that she was only in, in, in her seat for, I think, two terms. So that went pretty well. Um, and the caucus is still here. So I think that's, I think we can agree that that, that that ambition wasn't as successful as she might hope for. But 
I think it's different in the fact that they're that they are the collective voice of black members and at any given time 99% of black members in both chambers are members of the collective of the congressional black caucus. Um, that is distinct from like the congressional from from the Hispanic caucuses within the organization right because they split uh, a couple of some years ago into the Hispanic caucus and Hispanic conference, which were your 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 GOP members uh, who identified as Hispanic. So I think that's one area where that, that that's a distinction that we can make between those. So there's no rival caucus for I mean there's no there's no black rival caucus. Now there are caucuses that are diametrically opposed to their agenda, but that none of them are uh 99% African American. Yeah. And well, that's a very interesting concept that, it, in, that there's not a, this competitive, whereas the Hispanic ones do have a, a competitive caucus. Um, why is that? Like, how do they how do people get on the same page? You know, because even, you know, that's one very interesting concept about any faction in Congress. Right. How does it stay together? How does it stay unified mm -hmm. in its worldview and its legislative agenda and in, in what it perceives as the problems versus the solutions? You know, there there yeah. must be. I mean, can't everyone can't be exactly the same in their views on what should be done, you know, for the community. So how do they how do they uh, deal with those kinds of conflicts within the caucus? And do they have a, a governance mechanism to deal with it? Uh, they do. Right. Uh, I mean, the, the caucus is a deliberative body, just like Congress is. Right. And they they have democratic ways of selecting chairs for chairmen for the caucus. They, um, you know, in, in large part the ways that they come about their agenda is very democratic, all right? Um, they also leave space for their members to pr pursue more progressive ideas, right? And in fact, uh, the Congressional Progressive Caucus was founded by CBC members. It was founded by Ron Dellums and, and I think Maxine Waters was another one of those, uh, not, uh, was it Chisholm or Waters? I, 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 I might have misspoke, but I know Ron Dellums had a, a very heavy hand in creating the Progressive Caucus. And a, 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 a sizable chunk of the CBC members are also members of the Congressional Progressive Caucus that they can then use to leverage out, to seek out more progressive change, right? This is not to say that there isn't intra-group conflict about how progressive or how radical the agenda should be, but they are able to, to solve or to remedy some of those conflicts uh, and find some common ground uh, that they can pursue and without allowing for the tensions between the more progressive and more pragmatic wings of the caucus to divide them. And I think that's one of the things that is shown. It's a very, uh, that is proven over time of why the Congressional Black Caucus is so resilient, where in other instances, like the Tea Party, you have a divide to where you where the more radical ideas branch off into the Freedom Caucus, and you have this rift um, within these within within that faction that almost makes the the the, the opposite party a little bit more ungovernable because they are unable to you know resolve some of those conflicts. Yeah, absolutely. That's very interesting. And in terms of the legislative uh, piece of what they're doing, can you talk through a little bit about how do they go about that? Is it, you know, they're right. Is it writing legislation and then the members are submitting it in or are they, you know, are they all co-sponsoring each other's bills? You know, what's the actual legislative uh, strategies, actions that they've taken? And are there any notable successes or failures you've seen that are worth, uh, you know, talking about? So the answer to those questions is yes, like to all of them, right? They engage in all, any and all of these behaviors, right? They will find bills from well-established members in that that are influential influential in different in different committees, and they will back those bills. They will also uh, collectively write bills, like the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, right? That made it through the House twice. Um, they all so in terms of like bill sponsorship, they, they do any and all of these simultaneously, right? They also are really influential in connecting with the executive branch to try to to, to parse out like different executive orders that can, that they they might be able to influence and things like that. So there are there are a number of ways that they seek out policy change through legislative activities or the legislative activities that we're more commonly aware of. My work actually looks at the things that happen in between the time that the bill's sponsored or the bill's sponsored 
and a vote is a vote happens on the floor or in committee, right? I, I, there's there's like ninety five percent of the legislative process happens in between those two stages. Where a shortcoming of the literature on racial representation is that most people focus on the front end and the back end, right? They look at what bills they sponsor and they look at how they they end up on the floor, right? Um, but increasingly, there are folks that look at the, the policymaking process in Congress, folks like Mike Minta, who looks at oversight, the, the presence on oversight committees. Uh, Katrina Gamble looks at committee uh, participation uh, in the House of Representatives. Uh, you know, some folks like Dan Gilliam looks at how organizations and, and protests are able to influence information gathering and processing and discourse within institutions. I think my work fits in with those groups that look at that the, the policy making process as opposed to bill sponsorship and floor votes. Yeah. And so, in your research, you know, what have you found in that from from that bill introduction to the to the final vote or whatever. So what what happens there that's that's notable that you found that that uh, that's new? Yeah, for sure. So like it's not that I ignore the bill sponsorship aspect and in fact what the piece that I was speaking about earlier that looks at the winnowing process. It takes um this idea that black members sponsor bills in specific areas, right? That, that that's well traveled in the literature. Um and it also draws on work that looks at the winnowing process, right? As a natural function, both of human cognition and of institutions comprised of humans. So like Herbert Simon, Frank Bumgarner, these, these folks that look at this bottleneck of attention and the need to, 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 to hone in on specific issues because we can't pay attention to all of them because of, like that's not how our brains work, right? Um, and most studies look at the winnowing process as, again, colorblind. So that work looked at, there are two types of marginalization that happen, right? There is a marginalization that happens at a racial level where black sponsored bills, regardless of issue area, are, are winnowed at a disproportionate rate. Um, CDC, the areas that are on the CDC agenda are, are uh, winnowed at a disproportionate rate. And when Black members sponsor bills in the CDC areas, they're winnowed at a disproportionate rate, right? Where if a white Democrat sponsors a education bill, right, it has a higher chance of making it through the committee. And if uh, a GOP member sponsors a bill in education, it has a higher chance of making it through the committee. But Black members are doubly disadvantaged in these institutions. And if we once we realize that aspect of it, that before the bill even gets to the floor, they're at a, dis a double disadvantage, then we can understand why on the back end, it appears that they're being unsuccessful. Well, in all actuality, the institution is doing a relatively effective job of silencing them at the earliest stages of the process once a bill gets out of the hopper. And they're not even getting attention in committee levels who are the primary mode of winnowing, right? That is the first stop for these bills. So if they don't get attention in a committee, they're, they're, they will never make it to the floor. So it's things like that that I'm able to find or like in, in exploring that 95%, we're able to see it explains both things on the front end and findings that we have on the back end that without that little bit of information, uh, we 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 can make inferences that ne aren't necessarily tied to reality. And you know this disparity that you're talking about is it? Uh, what's the reason for it? Is it just you know pure racism? Is it that subject matter is you know different than you know that white Democrat you mentioned? Is it like a little bit more liberal or a little bit more conservative or? Is it just that they're typically more junior members or that they're more senior members? You know, what what it, yeah, what, so, what is your did, have you teased out the causes? And maybe then maybe that's that's the whole thing. It's that's not clear yet. Again, the answer to those questions is yes, right? Like collectively, it's 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 all of the above in, in a lot of cases, right? When, in, in that study, we 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 account for things like, or I account for things like ideological differences uh across members, even members. Uh, uh, black members who are in leadership positions on committees, right? 
are disadvantages in ways that white members who are mem uh, leadership on commi committees aren't, all right? So a second finding in that is that um, incorporation means something different when black members in leadership positions sponsor bills versus when their 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 counterparts do. Um, when black members sponsor bills outside of areas that CDC prioritize, they get a buck, right? There's an increase in the likelihood that those bills make it through the committee stage. But when they sponsor bills with that are tied to the CDC agenda, that, that likelihood is diminished, right? That's not the case for white members who are in, com in committee leadership and things like that, right? So there, there, there is this notion um, in the literature that that rocking the boat, right? Using your power to promote a more radical agenda is, is, is frowned upon. And this provides further evidence to support that. So what it also does is incentivizes them to not rock the boat because if they do get those that bump, then they're more likely to sponsor bills outside of the agenda so that they can credit claim. They can have their bills progress through the legislative process. Um, and this is not anything out of the norm. This happens across number, like all groups, right? But the the double disadvantage that Black members face in the institution is unique to Black members, right? And I think that's that's something that we wouldn't be able to parse out on the back end because we would see, okay, these bills made it to the House floor and they received a favorable vote. It's because they're committee chairs. It's because they're subcommittee chairs. It's because they have influence. But what we don't see is that it's also because those are bills that don't rock the boat, right? And these are that that's that that changes some of our inferences that we're able to make on the back end. Interesting. Well, let's let's move on to the the concept of you know this interplay between you know the, the groups within Congress, like the like the Congressional Black Caucus, and outside events. So I know you've done some work in this area. Can you talk through what you've studied there and what you found? The, the the big thing that I find fruitful about my research and what's what's paying dividends at the current moment is uh, this this idea that there's a dominant idea in, in in society that protesters and representative elected officials are somehow at odds with women, right? That part of the reason why there are protests is because representatives are ineffective, right? Um, and that they're not delivering on the the demands of the people so that the people have to now organize and take to the streets, right? Um, and there's also this tension from the other side that elective officials see protesters as a nuisance, right? And if they would just give them time and, and slash or accept incremental changes that they are able to extract, that they could make progress uh, over time. Right. But what I'm what I'm finding increasingly is that the and what what I argue is that these two groups need each other. Right. Because they play two totally different functions in the grand scheme of, of, of politics. Right. From the they're both agenda setters. Right. They are both in place to sound the alarm of problems that exist in the environment and work from Daniel Gillian, who is at, at Penn, um, finds that on one hand, protesters are sources of information, right? In, in regards to the types, of, the types of the issues, the relationship of the state to those issues and potential solutions that they may be able to derive, right? And there are certain things, like there are characteristics of these protests that communicate things both to elected officials and to the public, right? And elected officials and the public galvanize or counter mobilize around these different ideas that the protests have. On the other side, the, there is a need for information that the elected officials have to have to use to then change the the dynamics within the institution, right? And they have their own specific audiences that. Uh, that are hinging on their ability to capture and disseminate that information, right? So it's that that source slash receiver of information that 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 dynamic that changes how things operate. So I have a paper with with JD Racky, uh, who is affiliated with you all. Uh, um, well, I have a couple of papers uh, that looks at 
uh, how Black Lives Matter changed the, the preferences and behaviors of the Congressional Black Caucus over time, right? Um, prior to the Black Lives Matter movement, the caucus wasn't necessarily focused on progressive police reforms, right? Um, outside of banning uh, racial profiling, a lot of the bills and a lot of the attention on policing was focused on crime prevention, right? And, and largely so because most of the caucus at the time of the crime, 1994 crime bill supported more punitive policing approaches, right? And crime prevention and drug prevention, that was largely the, the avenues that it took, right? Um, but there was a distinct shift right at the time that Michael Brown was killed and in the, in the months after, where they went from effectively sponsoring no bills uh, in, in, in progressive policing areas like accountability, body cameras, things like that, to sponsoring dozens of bills across the caucus uh, in that area to increase accountability for police reform, right? So in the first wave of Black Lives Matter, it was kind of like a focusing event. It was an agenda changer. It shifted their preferences along the, uh, it, it shifted their behaviors within the institution, but it also challenged their mindset of what police reform could look like, what policymaking or what these target groups looked like, right? It, it forced them to say, we have to rethink the way that we view police and their relationship to the communities, uh, particularly when you see um, armed police engaging with largely peaceful protests in military gear, right? It goes from them trying to stop, like investing in crime prevention to investing in demilitarization, for example, right? Um, but that wouldn't have happened absent the movement, right? The second wave of Black Lives Matter, the, the Breonna Taylor, George Floyd wave of the movement was a focusing event for the Democratic Party, right? But And in between that time, the Congressional Black Caucus was engaging in floor speeches, sponsoring bills. They were shifting the in agenda internally. And the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor wave was a focusing event for the Democratic Party to get their collective stuff together to actually address the problem. And without both of those waves of movement, you don't get the George Floyd Justice, Justice and Policing Act, particularly given what their position was prior. Yeah. So <laughs> it's it's this 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 like duality between these two entities where you see them interacting with one another. Um, and I like I have work at the federal level and at the state level that, that examines that dynamic. It's interesting. So there's this notion of um, you know protests and activity you know, that's, that's happening on the street and it's also happening in the media and that's influencing and, and I presumably direct connection between, uh, you know, the community and the Black Caucus and, and the Congressional Black Caucus. So I'm curious, is there, what's the direction in the other direct, in the other way, right? You said there's speeches that they're making. Is there more like, because I guess one of my one of my think, thinkings about this the concept of protest, right, is oftentimes they're against something, um, but they don't always have a very clear, clearly articulated policy position on how to solve that problem, right? Oftentimes they're protesting a problem rather than protesting for a particular solution. How did that play out in this environment? Was it, you know, that there was no solution that was presented, and then the and then the Congressional Black Caucus or the members, you know formulated so potential solutions that would fit that problem or were the problems that the solutions brought up in the community and then the congressional black caucus was like championing those in the congress i think i think it's more of the latter than the former um you have uh with the black lives matter movement in particular and even with the civil rights movement right there were very clearly articulated policy demands right and there were a range of policy demands where the caucus comes in uh, within the institution is it takes that range of demands and figures out what they can get done in a reasonable amount of time with a reasonable amount of effort and expending a reasonable amount of, uh, amount of human and like political capital, right? Um, so in a way, the caucus filters the demands and 
tries to accomplish an agenda out of the range of demands that are brought to them by the by the movement, right? So again, we could look at the, uh, the the Black Lives Matter movement as a as a central example, right? They had everything from body cameras and accountability measures and reporting to abolish, right? And what the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act gave them was something in the middle, right? It's probably skewed more towards the 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 more pragmatic side, but um, it did incorporate many of the demands that were brought about, right? It incentivized community uh, community policing programs. It, it provided money for body cameras. It, it requires reporting of uh, extrajudicial police killings, but it also did some of the things that did that Black Lives Matter didn't ask for and uh, didn't prefer, right? So like providing money <laughs> for training, right? Pumping more money into the police forces when many of the people in Black Lives Matter were, were calling for them to defund and redistribute that money uh, to to other community aspects, right? So there, there's this there's this give and take, and in a way that might frustrate the movement, right? Um, because again, politics is a game of bartering, right? So um, if you're able to get the George Floyd Justice Policing Act through the House and eventually probably back through the Senate, it's going to take some bartering to do so, right? Um, it's also going to take some sacrifice on the part of the people within the institution to get that done. Like that's the argument that elected officials will have, right? On the other side, there's this problem, this persistent problem of the extrajudicial killing of black and brown folk in the community that they are constantly raising the alarm for, right? And what that does is that puts strains on the on the movement itself, but it also puts a uh, onus on the institution to be responsive. So where there's give on both sides, there's also take on both sides. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you know the the CBC would make it more practical, not practical, but make it more uh, something more likely to be able to be passed, right? They're selecting the way you articulate it is you got a, a series of potential policy solutions and they kind of narrow on the ones that think more would be likely to be successful to move through the body, right? That's that's interesting. How about the other side of it where, you know, there's there's a loud protest in the community and there's a movement, right? Like you said, but then as part of their community, there's maybe others who have a different opinion. Like maybe they're totally on board with the Black Lives Matter movement, but there might be some people who are totally against it, right? But it's they're still within the within the Black Brown community. Um, how do they resolve that problem? Because obviously they want to be responsive to the the protests, but there's there might be other people in their community that don't share those same things, but they're not in the news, right? So I'm curious about. How does that kind of go down inside the 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 caucus, right? Do they have those debates, or or is it mainly they're focused on, you know, the the what's in the news? Because I can imagine other groups the same way in in Congress, you know, whether you're representative X, Y, or Z, they respond to particular louder groups within their community versus ones that are quieter for whatever reason. I think we have to be very intentional about who we're speaking about when we're talking about these these oppositional voices, right? I think on one hand, uh, one thing that one success of the Black Lives Matter movement is it has uh, it, where it started off as Black and Brown communities collectively organized against the extrajudicial police killings. It expanded to include a, a really diverse pool of supporters across a range of ideological and political spectrums, right? So it's a, it's a much more inclusive movement in the later phases than it was in the beginning, right? So support for the policy ideas of the Black Lives Matter movement have increased since Michael Brown was killed exponentially, right? Um, it's also persuading those who were on the fence are now off the fence and in favor of Black Lives Matter. There's also a concerted counter mobilization that's been around almost the entire time as well, like a back the blue slash blue lives matter counterinsurgency that is also uh, relatively powerful and uh, it, it, it undercuts 
some of the messaging of the the, the Black Lives Matter movement, right? But it's it, what it, what the Blue Lives Matter counter mobilization is effective at is understanding its audience, right? Because what they're doing is they're applying counter pressures on those who would otherwise support more radical forms of police reform or at least more progressive forms of police reform by pointing out um, sometimes in, in, in bad faith certain relationships that communities have with their police, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that the people that are um, are counter mobilizing against Black Lives Matter are the ones that would interact with police altogether. And then we also have to ask what those interactions mean for those people in those communities, right? So there's there are there are there are a number of layers to this that complicate what a a, a member's responsiveness to the Black Lives Matter movement and any potential counter movement that may arise, but. Ultimately, from from the Black Caucus's perspective, they and, and they face similar pressures, right? I mean, they have members who are former police officers, like Val Demings, who you know, who um, who have to both answer to the Black community and who identify as cops, right? They're, that's their occupation. Um, and you have pragmatic members who are aware of the political backlash that more progressive policies might might bring about, right? So, like, Clyburn doesn't just answer to the the CDC. He doesn't just answer to the the members within his district, right? He also answers. Uh, he's the third most powerful Democrat in the in the Democratic caucus, right? So that's that is something that he that's on his mind as well. And it's not just him. It's more. It's it's a a group of more senior members, right? Um, but you also have these pressures from within the organization from members who are younger and more progressive who are pushing the agenda a little bit further left, not completely left, but a little bit further left than what it might have been in years prior. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about the concept of networks, because I know you, you're doing some work on that area. So yeah. can you talk through a little bit about you know, your, your focus on networks and how it plays into the other work that you're doing? Yeah, for sure. So one thing that I one thing that I was able to dive into really early in my graduate studies was the use of social network analysis to explore a lot of these questions. Right. If you're interested in collective activities, the best avenue to explore collective activities is social network analysis because it allows you to both identify and describe what these networks of members or, uh, or entities look like, but it also allows you to dig under the hood and see what principles are shaping their tendency to form these bonds, right? Uh, and it started off in my dissertation looking at congressional co-sponsorship. Where are members sponsoring bills, co-sponsoring bills with one another? Over time, it's shifted from looking at purely co-sponsorship to looking at broader broader ideas. Like, I have a paper that is uh, will probably be out by the time this is uh, publicized at Con Congress of the Presidency that looks at how the organization uses its, its infrastructure to acquire information about certain policy areas from area experts, from different businesses, from different researchers and scholars, um, all different types of sources of information to collectivize them and then use them in uh, in floor speeches, right? Um, we also, uh, another paper that I have with J.D. Uh, Racky looks at how members share ideas within these speeches, how they build off of one another, um, and how they use these speeches to define pop policy problems using shared characteristics, right? Because we look at, a lot of times we look at issues both broadly and within the Black community as separate issues, right? It's education, it's healthcare. But what the what members of the Congressional Black Caucus do is that they're actually saying that all these issues are intertwined and they share characteristics, right? We can't think about education or like educational performance without wondering what the healthcare in that area looks like, 
We can't think about crime without thinking about economic prosperity. We can't think about, um, you know, immigration without thinking about labor. Like all of these things are intertwined through these shared characteristics. And what we do is we map which issues are most connected to uh, which other issues based on those shared characteristics. So ultimately, from the, from the, from the federal uh, government section, we're looking at how the organization is able to connect different ideas, different people, um, different sources um, of information to advance their agenda. Uh, I also have a line of research that looks at how policies diffuse from one state to another. So how, uh, and one of my book projects looks at how uh, racially progressive and racially regressive policies spread or diffuse from one state to another, right? And I'm able to map that transmission of policies from, say, California to Colorado to Texas to uh, or from Florida to Georgia to Alabama and look at how things spread at each very stage, right? So we, that helps us understand how policies are made at the state level. And so we can, we can parse out why critical race theory bans are spreading from state to state or voter suppression that, uh, uh, diffuses from state to state um, or you know, policies such as that, right? Um, so yeah, I definitely use networks in a wide range of areas. Uh, it's, it's probably the, the dominant methodology that I use in my, in my research. Um, and it, it keeps opening up new avenues uh, as as data becomes available or as as we find additional data. It's really uh, interesting to see how all of these political entities are connected, and that's the best way to map them. So, what are the key ways that you are able to map these networks? Is it through like you know, for instance, we talked about co sponsorships, right? And then there's the caucus, or in the, you know, two people are in the same caucus together. You know, maybe they went to that same you know university together. What are the what are the ways that you're mapping the networks and what, what have you found that's the stronger bonds or whatever, that the more likely information is likely to travel through what type of network versus another? In, in ex examining the different ties that bind them, there are, there, there are a number of different ways. So like some people have found that, like you said, if they went to the same undergraduate university, they also sponsor bills together. Um, if, if members have similar backgrounds. Like uh, at one point, there were tons of CBC members who were previously activists, right? So like John Lewis type members who are community organizers, they're more likely to sponsor uh, bills together um, at, a, at an individual level, right? Um, but what what I also find in looking at the, the, the information processing piece that, that's uh, coming out soon, is that it's not just that certain cert, certain sources share attributes. It's that these these mechanisms within the organization allow them to pair sources to define problems in ways that might not exist absent that. Right. So they they're able to access more high quality sources and more specialized sources in order to in order to define policy problems, but to do so uh, without having to uh, sacrifice because of the cost of acquisition, right? Like the, some sources are more costly to, to reach than others, right? So if I wanna talk to a small business owner in Podunk, Mississippi, I have to send somebody to go get that, or I have to, you know, there, there are costs associated with acquiring that information um, as opposed to, reaching out to a think tank that might make data publicly available. They're, that's a, It's less costly to acquire that information. This is not necessarily to say that one source of information is better, but when we do account for all of that, they're able to acquire high quality information at a lower cost because uh, of the mechanisms that they have in, in place and that they've put in place over the last 50 years. So like that, that kind of was like a, a we're finding different things in different networks, right? Um, and th those are some of the things that 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 we're able to explore, and it, it also speaks to the breadth of findings that we can that we can derive from these networks. Excellent, thanks. Well, well let's move on to the phase two of the interview, where uh, I okay. ask questions uh, that I've asked all the guests, so we can later on compare the answers. Are you ready for phase two? I am. Awesome. Well, the first question I've got is, uh, what do you think congressional representation should mean? And really, this is referring to, you know, you're a member and 
you represent everybody in your district, just some people in your district? Uh, and how do you represent them? Are you reflecting their views? Are you making judgments on those views? And Or do you have something outside the box? I think, okay, so if I describe what I think representation should be, it would be responsiveness. And I think that applies across every level, right? At any level that we look at it. From a, micro, from a macro level, it's how well can the institution respond to problems that exist in the environment, right? And if the less responsive they are, the less represented they are. At a micro level, it's how these in, individuals can either uh, respond to the desires and needs of their constituencies and extract goods and services to uh, to solve those problems that plague their communities, right? Or to fulfill the needs of their communities. And at a meso level, which I think is interesting, is where the, the CBC comes into play, is how can organizations facilitate the responsiveness of the individual and the responsiveness at, uh, of, of the institution? And improve responsiveness overall. So I think I think that's how I would summarize it and, and how we can approach it from different levels. Yeah. I, I'm I want to recall something you mentioned earlier where you talked about the the CBC uh or an individual member who might be black or a, part of a community that they represent, they might represent that community across the nation, not just in their own district. You know, is, is that something that you think is a, you know, because you can make an argument that you know I'm I'm I represent you know Maryland's you know number two district and I only represent people there right that's it that's what I'm elected to do, uh, but then there's this notion that maybe I represent um, people outside of that district as well. So that that seems to be what you're implying with your earlier comment. I'm curious if you could elaborate on that a little bit and whether you think that's the case or whether really it's just in their own district that whether they're supposed to be representing. Oh no, this is something that not only. Um, is is broadly applicable to the members of the caucus. They explicitly state that, right? They they understand that there are millions of Black Americans that aren't represented by a Black member of Congress for a number of reasons, right? Um, and if they weren't working in their interests, right, to to solve problems that that exist in the Black community, then they would be left unrepresented, largely because for 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 the fact that. Um, many non-Black Democrats don't fully embrace uh, the, the advancement of Black and Brown communities, and the Republic, many of their Republican counterparts are either uh, ambivalent to them or they're actively working to regress the condition in, in, in Black America. Um, so early on, even in the earliest iterations of the caucus, it wasn't just a dyadic representation between themselves and members in their district. It's working collectively to seek out the best condition for Black Americans broadly across the country. Right. Next question is, um, how would your ideal Congress allocate its time now? So do you, do you want them in in D.C. 24 hours a day all year long, or do you want them back in the communities 99% of the time? And should they be legislating or doing oversight during that time? You know, how, how would you break their time down? I think the one place that's that's we're seeing a a diminishing, I think one, one aspect of congressional behavior that's diminishing over time is their, their earnest attempts at problem solving, right? Like using the congressional infrastructure to identify, understand, and solve real world problems. Uh, they are spending less time in committees. They are inviting fewer witnesses. Um, it's the, They are engaging less with the bureaucracy over time. And I feel like that is one place that if they spent an earnest effort to do those three things and actually do so in ways that aren't partisan and polarized, I feel like Congress would be much better off if they were honestly and earnestly attempting to solve problems that exist in the policy environment, because there are many. But, uh, you know, there's tons of research that suggests that they're doing less of that. Right. So, and in fact, you're you're alluding a little bit to my next question, which is how should debate, deliberation or dialogue occur or be structured in Congress? And, you know, it's interesting that your a lot of your research focuses on the caucus as a place where, you know, a lot of this is happening versus in the committee or versus the floor. So, can you talk about where you think this should happen? Is it is it good that it's in the caucus or should it be in committees more than it is or should it be on the floor more than it is? Uh, or do you think caucuses are a good place for a lot of this debate to happen since, you know, committees have been more or less marginalized recently? So I think I can answer this question a couple of ways. I think one way, yes, I think there should be more 
debate and deliberation on the high school, right? I think that's that's what the body was was designed for. It's a deliberative institution. Um, I, and I also believe that caucuses should have a more heavy hand in shaping debate and deliberation because you're also able to collect both collectivize and uh, find and in a way disperse a, a variety or a diverse source sources of, of debate and deliberation within the institution. So more voices are heard, um, and they're they're you're able to draw a consensus on where certain groups stand within the institution. But I also have to say that debate and deliberation in the twenty in, in twenty twenty three and beyond happens online, right? And there are tons of researchers that are looking at how um, policymakers have transformed Twitter into a deliberative extension of Congress, right? Where a lot of policy is made in 200 characters or, or less. And um, that's that's not going to change, right? I mean, unless Elon Musk decides to just like suicide bomb the, the Twitter space. But I, we haven't got there yet. But so, like as of right now, that's where a lot of the debate and deliberation happens. It's also where a lot of the collaboration happens, right? Um, you have uh, strange bedfellows like like <laughs> um, like Ted Cruz and AOC agree <laughs> on Twitter to certain policy ideas, um, and I think that might be a pathway or not necessarily a pathway, but that amplifies the ability for there to exist spaces outside of the institution for which deliberation can take place. Next question is what fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make within 50 years? Um, ways to hold members accountable. Uh, I think as of right now, the, the, the uh, leverage that leadership has over rank and file members and good actors have over bad actors has diminished over time. Uh, and there are fewer and fewer and fewer means to which you can regulate bad behavior within the institution. Um, I think that's one way. Uh, the next thing is, is abolishing the filibuster uh, or at least make reforming it to make it harder. There are certain reforms that you can make to the filibuster right now that don't require uh, dropping the vote threshold that would ease that log jam in the Senate. Making it a speaking filibuster in and of itself would change how the Senate runs in its totality, right? Like mandating, if you're going to filibuster, you got to get up there and stand there for 24 hours or 48 hours, however long you're going to do it. But fewer people would actually filibuster or it make they would have to stand on their own, you know, <laughs> their loins to, to actually say what they mean and what they say rather than hiding behind a closure plate. And I think that's that's one simple thing that you can do is make it a mandate of speaking filibuster um, to clear some of that log jam. Right. Next question is what book or article uh, most shaped your thinking with respect to congressional reform? So in, in regards to congressional reform, a couple of books that um, that I've found most applicable are things like Legislating in the Dark by Curry uh, and Unorthodox Law Making uh, by Sinclair, right? Like these are these are two books that have been fundamental in understanding a modern Congress for me. Uh, but politics in general, uh, Semi Software People by Shaq Snyder, because um, it, it, it's the it's my favorite book in understanding conflict and how power dynamics are distributed and how the powerful seek to suppress the, 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 the marginalized and how the marginalized can eventually win, right? So if I'm, gonna, if I'm interested in understanding how a small faction of Black members can reorient dynamics within the institution, I think semi sovereign people actually gives us a good look at that. Excellent. So last question is really around your, your plans. You know, what do you have in the pipeline uh, that we can look forward to? Oh, man, I have way too much. Uh, I'm currently now working on three separate book projects, one that looks at policy diffusion at the state level, the other that, that looks focused, that focuses largely on the evolution of the Congressional Black Caucus. And then I'm also like, this is really like interesting project that I've recently been pulled on to that looks at how Black women change the Congressional Black Caucus um, at, at different critical junctures 
and how they're really central in the evolution of the Congressional Black Caucus. So that's like, I, I'm really excited about that. I also have an NSF grant that looks at how uh, movements and grassroots organizations shape, shape uh, conventional and unconventional modes of political participation and responsiveness from government. So for the next three years, hopefully longer, if we can get it extended, we'll be looking specifically at how uh, protesters are and people that are involved in grassroots movements organize, spread information, and motivate political behaviors. Um, those are the big things that are on my agenda. Um, and I'm sure I'll have 10 more by the time somebody watches this. So yeah, that's just how I operate. I'm really looking forward to it. And also there's, you know, in moving to the DMV in the fall, there, there I'm sure there will be other opportunities as well to, to, to dive into some more research. Excellent. Looking forward to it. So Professor PA, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's been fun.